So good evening. A couple of things I want to explain before we go back to where we were last week. The word Dhamma, which means literally that which supports or upholds or sustains us from falling into what are called the lower realms. So this word has other meanings, but in this particular context we're talking about what the Buddha taught. So Dhamma can also mean the truth. The Buddha didn't differentiate between his teachings and the truth. He said he taught the truth. And to explain to you about lower realms, we have the 31 planes of existence. You will see that there are 31 uh, planes, or rather 31 realms, divided into three planes. This is explaining the different levels of existence. Some of these realms we can perceive and some we cannot. If you go to the bottom half of the page, you'll see sense sphere planes 11. This is where our senses, as we normally talk about senses, the five external senses and the mind, which is also a sense, these senses are operating strongly and we experience many things connected with our senses. Now this plane is subdivided into what it calls woeful planes and sensuous blissful planes. The woeful planes are places of suffering. First one is called the, the hell realm. Um, there are various imaginative ways in which we can describe what it's like to be in a hell realm. Above that is the animal realm. Generally speaking, I know there are exceptions, but generally speaking, animals are experiencing a lot of problems, a lot of suffering. Everybody eats each other, struggle to get food, struggle to survive. It's not a happy place. Peta, peta means a hungry ghost. These are beings who are portrayed with images of huge bellies and a very, very, very thin throat. So they cannot take on the amount of food and drink they need to satisfy their hunger. Above that are asuras. We don't really have an English word for asura. Sometimes translated as a titan. A being that is actually full of jealousy for the beings living in the higher planes. Then we have the human plane. And above that, we have six what are generally called heavenly planes, heavenly realms, where beings are enjoying 
a pleasant or happy existence. If somebody asks, are there gods in Buddhism? We would say yes. Planes 6 to 11 are what we call gods. But two things are important. The first is that these gods are not eternal. Secondly, they are unable to influence the lives of other beings. In some religions there is a supreme deity, a supreme god, who is seen as able to um, influence lives of others. That is not the case in Buddhism. You will see on the right-hand side there's an increasing lifespan. Well, the, bo the bottom five just says indefinite. But above that, you can see a number of celestial years that these beings can live. Above that, we have the fine material sphere plane, the 16 of them. These are attained by beings who are experienced, skilled meditators. And by practicing a certain form of meditation, they can attain states we call jhana. I mentioned jhana last week. In Sanskrit is dhyana and then Chan Buddhism in China and Zen Buddhism in Japan. And beings born in these, well, first of all, these planes can be attained even in the human realm temporarily by attaining states of jhana during meditation. But if you are a skilled meditator, and a habitual, um, habitually you are able to attain these planes, then at uh, death you may be reborn in one of these higher planes. And above that, there are four immaterial planes. That is because there is no longer any physical body it's just mind. And these are very, very refined states of mind. Last week I mentioned the, the Prince Siddhartha had two teachers, Alarika Lama and Uddhika Ramaputta. Alarika Lama, he taught the attainment of number 30, nothingness. And Uddhakarama Putta, he taught number 31, neither perception nor non-perception. So these planes are not unique to Buddhism, and they can be attained by anyone who is sufficiently diligent and skillful in practicing a form of meditation we call Samatha meditation or calming meditation. Here now the, the lifespan has increased into eons. To give you an idea of what is an eon, think of a block of rock. One mile wide, one mile long, one mile high. Once in a hundred years, a man comes with a silk handkerchief, just touches the rock. That rock will be worn away before an eon has come to an end. So it's a long time. 
Now the point about all of these different realms is that none of them is permanent. Sooner or later, life in that particular realm comes to an end. And then there is the process of rebirth. And the rebirth will be governed by our actions. The word kamma. If we have performed wholesome actions, they will have wholesome effects. If we have performed unwholesome actions, they will have unwholesome effects. So regardless of how you've been living in these planes, when your life is up in one of those planes, rebirth follows, and it may not be in another happy plane. It depends upon whatever karma ripens at the moment of death. So, if you've had some unskillful action stored up for several lifetimes, that could condition a life in one of the woeful planes. The problem with the life in these woeful planes is that it's very, very difficult to get out of them because you need to perform good karma, wholesome karma. How are you going to do that when you're suffering miserably? The Buddha said that the human plane is the most important plane because in the human plane we can hear the Buddha's teachings and we can practice them, we can develop our minds according to his principles and we from that development can attain Nibbana, enlightenment. The trouble with these higher planes is that they're so enjoyable people are just sitting around doing nothing all day but um, drinking ambrosia and watching television. They're, they've got, they're not actually doing much with their lives, they're just enjoying them. So the human plane is very important. Human plane is a mixture of both happiness and unhappiness. So we have the carrot and we have the stick. The carrot is happiness. We can experience happiness and we like it and so we want more of it. So we have an incentive to try to live a good life. The stick is that we also experience unhappiness and we don't like it. So that prompts us also to try to live a good life rather than do unskillful things. So when I said the word Dhamma supports us, it is a support that prevents us from falling down into the woeful planes. So the Buddha's teaching helps us to live a good life and a happier life. Any questions about the, these planes? That makes sense? Yeah, the Buddha said, though, the, the 31. Yep. Is that 84,000 aeons to say that you're... Great eons, yes. Yeah. It's a long time. Really long time to have yep. that's, that's the highest plane that you can get to. For me, that, I think that's the worst plane, really. Well, you might say so, yep. I mean, these things are very relative. If you think of an insect that lives maybe for a day, and you would say to that insect, you know, there are beings that live for 70, 80, 100 years. The insect's going to say, come off it. Don't believe it. 100 years? You're pulling my leg. So we see things 
in terms of our human perception. But maybe there are other things going on. I know that we cannot detect all of these planes. We can detect a, the human plane. We can detect the animal plane. Sometimes people say they've seen a ghost. But if you think of it like um, the radio, your radio may be tuned in to receive radio one. It can't at the same time receive radio two, three, and four, or five. So it doesn't mean to say those are not also there, but it's just you're not tuned into them. So maybe we're not tuned in to receiving these higher realms. So I agree, we cannot prove their existence objectively. They can be proved, if you wish to, by practicing and perfecting the techniques of meditation I mentioned. So that is, the, that is the first thing I just wanted to mention, because we shall come on to these realms from time to time. I would also say, yes, life in these realms is all considered to be part of, the word is samsara. Samsara is the endless round of birth, death, another birth, another death another birth, another death, going on and on and on. Sometimes the birth may be in a happy state, sometimes the birth may be in an unhappy state, but this, just, this, this cycle of life continues indefinitely. The Buddha said, Inconceivable is the beginning of this samsara. Not to be discovered is a first beginning of beings who, obstructed by ignorance and ensnared by craving, are hurrying and hastening through this round of rebirths. Which do you think is more? The flood of tears which, weeping and wailing, you have shed upon this long way hurrying and hastening through this round of rebirths, united with the undesired, separated from the desired, this or the waters of the four great oceans. Long have you suffered the death of father and mother, of sons, daughters, brothers and sisters, and whilst you were thus suffering, you have indeed shed more tears upon this long way than there is water in the four great oceans oceans. So, he said, inconceivable is the beginning. Sometimes people ask, what did the Buddha say about the beginning of the world, the beginning of life? He didn't say anything very much. He just said, even he could not see back to the beginning of this process. He was much more concerned with where we are at the moment and getting ourselves extricated from our present problems, not worrying about where we all came from in the first place. So, samsara is regarded as, an, generally speaking, an unhappy existence in that there is no permanent happiness to be found. There is temporary happiness, certainly. Even as human beings, we experience temporary happiness. 
but we don't experience permanent happiness. The good times come to an end sooner or later. And for the Buddha, that was very unsatisfactory. He wanted permanent happiness, lasting happiness, not something which would come and go and come and go. So by attaining the state of enlightenment, you step off these, this chart completely. The state of Nibbana is not shown here. Nibbana means permanent happiness. It's not subject to these rounds of birth again and again and again. Straight after his enlightenment, the Buddha said, this is my last birth. There is no more coming to be. And he was happy about that because he saw birth as the prelude, inevitably, to various forms of suffering and unhappiness. So we, <laughs> from the Buddhist point of view, we shouldn't really get happy at, at the birth of somebody because we know that being is going to experience sooner or later, to a lesser or greater extent, forms of unhappiness. But if we can step out of this whole cycle and attain the state of Nibbana, then that is permanent happiness. So let us think back to last week where we had the Buddha sitting under the Bodhi tree and attaining enlightenment. He spent the next seven weeks sitting under the tree, pondering on what it was he had discovered, deepening his understanding, and then the question came up, what now? He'd attained enlightenment. That was his goal. He was still a young man, 35 years of age, healthy. He could live out, if he wished, the rest of his life enjoying the bliss of his attainment. And then he also thought, hmm, should I teach what I have discovered to help other beings? And he reflected, this Dhamma, one by me, is deep, difficult to see, difficult to understand, peaceful, excellent, not within the sphere of logic, meaning you cannot just reason your way to Nibbāna. Subtle, intelligible to the learned. But this is a creation delighting in sensual pleasure, delighted by sensual pleasure, rejoicing in sensual pleasure. So that for a creation delighting in sensual pleasure, this were a matter difficult to see. So, he hesitated. If I were to teach this Dhamma, and others were not to understand me, this would be a weariness to me, this would be a vexation to me. With difficulty, have I comprehended the Dhamma? There is no need to proclaim it now. This Dhamma is not easily understood by those who are dominated by lust and hatred. The lust-ridden, shrouded in darkness, do not see this Dhamma, which goes against the stream, which is profound, difficult to perceive, and subtle. Going against the stream, patisotagami. What he's saying is that human beings generally seek out sense pleasures. They think 
that by amassing sense pleasures, they will be happy. The problem being, of course, that these sense pleasures don't last, and so we don't find lasting happiness. So, this is why he hesitated to teach. And it is said that Sahampati, the, the king of the gods, that means he was living in Rome number 11. He appeared before the Buddha and said, Sir, please teach the Dhamma. There are beings with little dust in their eyes who, not hearing the Dhamma, are decaying. But if they are learners of the Dhamma, they will grow. And so he repeated this request three times. And then the Buddha said, OK, open for those who wish to hear are the doors of the deathless. So he had taken the decision to teach what it was he had discovered out of compassion that there would be some beings, maybe not many, but there would be a few beings with little dust in their eyes. Most beings have a lot of dust in their eyes, but there would be a few, and they would benefit from hearing what he had to say. So he made the decision to teach. What was unusual at that time was that this teaching was open to everyone to hear. The, the Brahmins and their teachings were restricted only to the Brahmin priests. Other people could not hear their teaching. But the Buddha said, my teaching is open to everybody. Doesn't matter what your social status or social class, doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor, whether you're a king or whether you're a pauper, man, woman, child, everybody can hear my teaching. And this was unusual at that time. So he then met two merchants, Kapusa and Balika, who listened to what the Buddha had to say. He didn't give them a big, thorough, deep teaching. But they were impressed. They asked him, please, can you give us something which we can use to remember you by? <laughs> the Buddha had nothing material to give them, except it was said he plucked some hairs out of his head and gave these to these two men. And they went to Sri Lanka, and those hairs are now enshrined in a stupa in Sri Lanka. Unless you follow the Burmese version of the story, where the two merchants went to Burma, and the hairs are enshrined in a different stupa in the capital, Yangon. But there's a third story that these two merchants went to Persia and the hairs were enshrined somewhere in Persia. You pay, you take, you pay as your money, you take as your choice. You don't know where, where, who's right? Well, I don't think we can know. So after that, he had to think, who could he teach? He thought he would teach his first teacher, Alara Kalama. But he came to know that Alara Kalama had died just a week before. So then he thought he'd teach Uddhika Ramaputta. But he had died just a day before. So then he decided he would try to teach the five ascetics with whom he had been practicing these austerities for five years. 
They at that time were living in Isipatana. He was in Buddha Gaya, and so he had to journey about 130 miles on foot to Isipatana. When they saw him coming, they were not very impressed. Oh, here comes that, uh, that man who abandoned our principles of self-mortification. They had left him, remember, in disgust because he'd given up on all their austerities. So they were not enthusiastic when they saw him. They said, ah, this recluse Gotama is coming. He lives in abundance. Well, that's a very relative term, not, not what we would call abundance today, but he lives in abundance. He is wavering in his striving. He has reverted to a life of abundance. He should be neither greeted nor stood up for, nor should his bowl and robe be received. All the same, a seat may be put out. You can sit down and join us. As the Buddha approached, there was something about his bearing, about his manner, that made an impression on these men. So when he arrived, they greeted him and said, uh, welcome, friend. The word they used was avuzo. And the Buddha said, do not call me by that term. I am now a tathagata. Thagata was the term which the Buddha always used to talk about himself. And it has several meanings. Um, it can mean one who has found the truth. It can also mean that he came as previous Buddhas have come and he went as previous Buddhas went. He did as he said, and he said as he did. He was not a hypocrite. It doesn't really matter what exactly the term means. But um, this is the word you find in all the texts when the Buddha talks about himself. He never called himself the Buddha. He talked about the Tathagata. So now the Buddha says, I'm, I'm a Tathagata. And he said, um, you don't believe me. And they said, well, not really. He said, well, have I ever talked like this to you before? No, you haven't. Well then, listen to what I have to say. And he started then to deliver what we call his first sermon. One possible date is 588 BC, but it does depend on which date you take for the birth of the Buddha. You all have a copy of this. And you can see in the Pali, it is called the Dhamma Chakka Pavatana. Sutta. A sutta in Pali or sutra in Sanskrit means a string. We have the medical term sutra when you're stitched up, the sutras. That also means a string. And this is, you, you hang together 
like beads on the string. You hand together the points of your argument, the points of your teaching. You put them on this string. So all the Buddha's discourses are called suttas. And Dhamma is the truth. Chakra, or chakra in Sanskrit, is a wheel. And Pavatana, the, the turning of the wheel. He is going to turn the wheel of truth, spreading his teaching. So he's talking just to five people. Just five rather skeptical followers, or they were not even followers at that time. But from this grew the, the mighty uh, growth of Buddhism in many parts of the East and more recently has come to the West. So let's look at this sutta. Starts with the words, thus have I heard. You may remember, I mentioned to you last week that the first, um, the first council, three months after the death of the Buddha, was where they rehearsed all of his teachings. And Venerable Ananda, his personal attendant, who had the perfect memory, he was given the job of reciting to the assembled group of highly uh, learned, enlightened monks what the Buddha had said. And so all these suttas start with the same term. Thus have I heard. This is what I, Ananda, heard the Buddha say. The Blessed One was once living in the deer park at Isipatana, the resort of seers. It was a popular place for all sorts of religious people to go and uh, expound their doctrines. Where Sorry? Where it says here it's near Baranasi or Benares. Did you, did you get a copy of a map last week? If you look on your map, you will find that it is, it is shown there. If you find Bodh Gaya, where he attained enlightenment, and then go south, or southeast a little bit, then you'll come to Isipatana. The, the town of Benares, or Varanasi, is still in existence today and highly revered by the Hindus. I think I'm right in saying that is where they like to go to have their bodies cremated and the ashes put into the river, Ganges. There he addressed the group of five bhikkhus. Now the word bhikkhu normally means a Buddhist monk. But these people were not Buddhist monks. They weren't ordained monks yet. The literal meaning of a bhikkhu is someone who relies on others for his food. Someone, I don't like to use the word beg, because in English that word beg has a rather pejorative sense. But people who are fed by the goodwill of the community. Bhikkhus, these two extremes ought not to be practiced by one who has gone forth from the household life. He had gone forth from the household life at the age of 29. Other people also. 
He calls it an act of renunciation. They renounce the household life. They give up material possessions. They give up conventional status and power and so forth. They leave the household life. What are the two extremes? There is devotion to the indulgence of sense pleasures, which is low, common, the way of ordinary people, unworthy and unprofitable. And there is devotion to self-mortification, which is painful, unworthy, and unprofitable. What gives him the right to say that? Exactly. For the first 29 years of his life, he had a life indulging in sense pleasures. He was living in a very sheltered environment, son of the local king, every sense pleasure available at that time was available to him. And he found that to be unsatisfactory. He then renounced that life, and after seeing Alara Kalama and Uddhukarama Putta, he then practiced self-mortification. And based on that experience, he found it to be painful, unworthy, and unprofitable. Remember, the five men he's talking to are still practicing self-mortification. So he's telling them, you are wasting your time. Avoiding both these extremes the Tathagata has realized the middle path. Now, this is one of the hallmarks of the Buddha's teachings, the middle path or the middle way, the avoidance of extremes. Extreme of indulgence and sense pleasures, extreme of self-mortification. And there are two other extremes which we still recognized today. We might not call them extremes, but they are very much opposed. The doctrine of annihilationism and the doctrine of eternalism. Some people will say, at death, we are annihilated. Nothing continues. Nothing goes on at all. Other people say, at death, something survives and may enter an eternal state or condition. If you are somebody enjoying sense pleasures, the chances are you are also an annihilationist. Because you say, eat, drink, be merry, Tomorrow we die, and after that, the end. So, really enjoy yourselves now. Make the absolute maximum you can from all the sense pleasures available to you. Indulge, indulge, indulge to excess. On the other hand, the self-mortification people keep themselves going with the belief that the greater they mortify the flesh now, the bigger will be the spiritual attainment in the next life. So they, if, they, if they were annihilationists, they, they, there's no point in doing self-mortification. So the Buddha has realized the middle path. It gives vision, it gives knowledge, and it leads to calm, to insight, to enlightenment, to nibbana. That is the final goal. You can, in fact, take the Buddha's teachings 
on three levels. The first level is to, is to help us to live happier lives in this life, telling us what sort of things are good to do and what sort of things are bad to do and what sort of things we should try to develop and what sort of things we should try to eradicate from our characters. The second level is that we can create for ourselves the causes which will lead to happiness in a later life. If you do lots of good works in this life, then you are helping to create the conditions for a happy rebirth. But the Buddha goes further than this. What he wants to do eventually is for us to attain the state of enlightenment. No more lives after this one. Finished completely. Eternal, lasting, perfect happiness. And he says that that can be attained by the middle path. And what is that middle path? It is simply the noble eightfold path. Namely, right view, right thought, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. This is the middle path realized by the Tathagata, which gives vision, which gives knowledge, and which leads to calm, to insight, to enlightenment, to Nibbana. So it is this noble eightfold path, which is the path we can all tread to reach the state of Nibbana. Notice he says this is the middle path realized by the Tathagata. Not invented. The truths that he's talking about have always existed. But people were not aware of them. He figured out the way to these truths. He didn't have a teacher. He figured it out for himself. But you can think of it like uh, gravity. The force of gravity has always existed. It wasn't until Newton came along that he discovered this law. He didn't invent it, he discovered it. Same way the Buddha did not invent these truths, but he discovered them. So, when he starts this, or before he starts giving this sermon, the Buddha says to he, these five men, I shall instruct and teach the Dhamma. If you act according to my instructions, you will long, oh, sorry, you will before long realize attaining in this life itself by your own intuitive wisdom that supreme consummation of the holy life for the sake of which sons of noble families rightly leave the household for homelessness. This is a very important statement here. I shall instruct and teach the Dhamma if you act according to my instructions. He's not saying if you bow down and worship me, if you perform all sorts of practices, magical things. No. Follow my instructions. So he's, he, this is the role of the Buddha. He's an instructor, a teacher. The Buddha is not a divine being. 
to be worshipped, to be prayed to, to be asked for guidance or for help. He's telling us, I'm going to give you some instructions. Now, it's up to you to follow these instructions. He said, you yourselves must make the effort. Buddhas are only teachers. So he says, if you act according to my instructions, you will, before long, realize attaining in this life itself the attainment of Nibbāna is possible in this life. For some people it might seem an impossibly lofty goal. But people at the time of the Buddha and in the subsequent centuries have attained enlightenment by following his instructions. And this is how we can test do these instructions work or not? Try and see. Then you know. So, if you follow my instructions, you will before long realize attaining in this life itself by your own intuitive wisdom or your own direct knowledge. This is something you will know for yourself. Not something that's going to be given to you by some outside power or force. This is something that you can generate, this direct knowledge, this direct understanding. That su so you will, you will realize that supreme consummation of the holy life, for the sake of which sons of noble families rightly leave the home for homelessness. It's now eight o'clock. Do you think it's time for a cup of tea? Okay. So, first paragraph down on page ninety-three. The noble truth of suffering, brackets, dukkha, is this. Birth is suffering, aging is suffering, sickness is suffering. Death is suffering, sorrow and lamentation, pain, grief and despair are suffering. That falls into the category of dukkha, dukkha. Plain, straightforward suffering as we mean it in English. Birth is a painful experience. Aging, sickness, death, those are physical forms of suffering. Then mental pain, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief and despair. Those would be cases of examples of mental suffering. But we shall now perhaps understand that the word suffering is not a very good translation of the Pali word dukkha. There's no English word that conveys the breadth and the depth of this word dukkha. Literally, du, du, is hard, and k uh, comes from a word that means endure. That which is hard to endure. And this covers a huge range of experiences. Yes, old age, sickness, death, pain, sorrow, woe, lamentation, these are indeed forms of suffering, as the English word means. But now we're getting to a little bit more um, subtle. Association with the unpleasant is suffering. Uh, 
you've been stuck here now for about an hour and a half. You're going to be stuck here for another half an hour. Is this association with the unpleasant? Are you regretting that you're stuck here this evening? Are you wishing, oh, I wish that man would stop talking and talking and talking. I wish I'd not come. I wish I could go home. I wish I'd have sat at home and I could have watched football on the television tonight. So this is to be associated with what you do not like. Maybe you're stuck in the tube. Rush hour. You're crammed in there. One person's standing on your foot, somebody else is jabbing in the back with their umbrella. Another person is breathing garlic fumes all over you. I want to get out of here. I don't like it here. Now, that might not be suffering, as the English word means, suffering, but it is unpleasant. It is frustration, it is dissatisfaction, it is all sorts of more subtle experiences than just suffering. And we have the opposite. We have dissociation from the pleasant. That means maybe you have plans for the weekend to meet up with some friends. But for some reason or other, it's not possible. So now you're separated from the friends you wanted to see at the weekend. And you feel a degree of disappointment. Again, not suffering as the English word means it, but an element of dissatisfaction, of, of um, feeling, uh, you know, I'm not happy. And then we have the clencher. Not to get what one wants is suffering. How many times a day do we experience that? You're standing at the bus stop. I want the bus to come now. It doesn't. I wanted it to be a warm, sunny summer's day. It wasn't. I wish the people in the flat next to me would stop making so much noise. I want, I want them to shut up. Life is full of frustrations and disappointments. Some minor, some major. But if you think about it, how many times a day do you not get what you want? So this is not gross suffering like old age, sickness and death. But it is still dukkha as the Buddha means it. So that is dukkha dukkha. Viparinama dukkha is the suffering caused by change. One of the hallmarks of the Buddha's teachings is that everything is impermanent, everything changes. That itself is not a problem that everything changes. The problem is that we resist the change. We don't want it to change. We want the perfect day never to end. We want to be healthy all our lives. We want to be youthful, energetic all our lives. But change takes place. You look in the mirror and you can see your hair is falling out. And you're happy to see that. So many things we strive to attain, and then they don't last. You saved up your money, bought, buy yourself 
a beautiful pair of leather shoes, looking immaculate, he was so pleased with them, they were wonderful. And then the third time on, you scuff the leather, you cut the leather, and the leather is now spoiled. What was such a perfect possession has changed. In the long run, everything changes. Relationships change, ultimately, uh, in the end, because one part of the relationship dies. So it's not the problem with the change taking place, it's the problem that we resist this change. We don't want the change to take place. We want things to last and last and last, unchanging forever. And when they do change, then we feel dukkha, disappointment. And I think you can see this in so many aspects of our lives. We think, oh, if only I had a nice house to live in. If only I had that particular job. If only I had this, or if only I had that, then I'd be happy. But <laughs> it doesn't always work like that. You can have a wonderful job, and then the company collapses, and you're made redundant. You have a lovely house. And then the planners pass an application for a motorway to be built next to your house. So many things in life change. And so the mistake we make is to try to hold on to things as if they are permanent. OK, things are only temporary. That doesn't mean to say we can't enjoy them. Yes, you can enjoy things that you like, but don't think they're going to last forever. They won't do. So be realistic in your expectations. Don't think that you can find permanent happiness from impermanent causes. The Buddha never denied that there is happiness in the human plane. But he said this is not permanent, not lasting happiness. It will change sooner or later. So be realistic. Don't expect the impossible. I think it's a very, well for me anyway, it's a very, very valuable teaching to try to understand that everything is going to change sooner or later. Whilst you have it, yeah, fine, enjoy it. But don't be attached to it. That is the problem. And then we come to the third form of suffering. In brief, the five aggregates of attachment are suffering. That is called sankhara, dukkha. And you should have somewhere a little chart of the top it says samsara. Samsara is the entire psycho-phenomenal, psychophysical world. And a being is subdivided into two, physical and mental. That much uh, even Western thought recognizes the division, physical and mental, body and mind. But now we get to a level which we don't have in Western thought, what is listed as the second division. Rupa, Vedana, Sanya, Sankara, and Vijnana. These are called khandas, translated in English as aggregates. Five aggregates. This is how the Buddha analyzed a human being. We are made up 
of five groups of aggregates. Number one is the physical form, the body, which is composed of um, elements, which we won't go into at the moment, but you can see there are four elements, symbolically called earth, water, fire, and wind, are the properties of extension, cohesion, radiation, and motion. That's the body. The mind is broken down into four different kandas. Vedana is a sensation. Sensation arises when one of our senses comes into contact with an object. When you place your hand onto a hot plate, you get a sensation. In this case, an unpleasant sensation. When you place a piece of delicious cake into your mouth, you get another sensation, a pleasant sensation. And there are some sensations which are neither pleasant nor painful, neutral. Then there is perception. This is a process by which we come to recognize something. When you look, uh, look onto the table, you see a cup. The perception process is what has taken place to enable you to say, ah, that is a cup. It's a blue cup. It's a teacup. It's got a handle on it. You gradually get to know in better and better detail what it is you're seeing. So that is the function of sanya or perception. Sankara is a word which is impossible to translate. Some people call uh, it's translated sometimes as volitional formations. And then everybody says, what's a volitional formation? These are mental qualities which accompany sensations and perceptions, the first two, Vedana and Sanya. There are 50 Sankaras. Some of them are wholesome, some of them are unwholesome. Some of them are unwholesome. We can have qualities like anger or hatred, ill will, conceit. Some of them are positive, wholesome, like love and compassion. And some of them have a purely functional role, which is things like um, concentration, um, determination. There are, as I said, 50 of these. And then Vijnana, or consciousness, is the receptacle into which Vedana, Sanya, and Sankara can be placed. Consciousness is what we would call awareness. In the Buddha's teachings, Any moment of consciousness has to have an object. You cannot have pure consciousness. It has to have an object, and the object has to come through one of our senses. So we have a visible object, audible object, gustatory object, tactile object, olfactory object, or mental object. Mind by itself is also a sense. So an abstract thought, that's a mind object. 
you cannot have just pure consciousness. Consciousness without an object cannot arise. If you think about um, a fire, if you light a fire, it has to be either a wood fire, a gas fire, a coal fire. It cannot just be fire by itself. There must be some material thing associated with the fire. In the same way, there must be an object associated with consciousness. So consciousness is not something which exists the whole time. Perhaps in the West we think of consciousness as being, consciousness is there. Uh, we are alert. And then consciousness experiences certain things. Consciousness experiences first a smell, and then a taste, and then a touch. But the Buddha's analysis is that consciousness arises and passes away millions of times in a split second. There's a moment of seeing consciousness followed by a moment of hearing consciousness, followed by a moment of seeing consciousness, followed by another moment of hearing consciousness. This process takes place so rapidly that we can't see it. We can't perceive it. It's too rapid for us to see. So the Buddha's concept of the being is not of something static. It's of something which is constantly changing from moment to moment, second to second. There's constantly change, change, change. There's no time when we can say things are static. So this is a different concept from, I think, how we regard things in the West. The being is something changing. There is a place where the Buddha says, it's like a mountain river, flowing far and swift, taking everything along with it. There is no moment, no instant, no second when it stops flowing. But it goes on flowing and continuing. So is human life, like a mountain river. So he's showing us a rather different uh, explanation of what you and I are. We're a state of constant change. Moment to moment, there is change. Now, I said there's a third form of dukkha, sankara dukkha. This is the suffering caused by, the explanation here is, the five aggregates of attachment are suffering. See at the end of that paragraph. So this is the five khandhas, the five aggregates of attachment. So the dukkha, the suffering, is not in the five aggregates. It's in the attachment. Sometimes the word grasping is used instead of attachment. We try to hold on to the aggregates. We try to make them into something they're not. We try to make them into something permanent and unchanging. It's like trying to hold water in your hand and stop the water leaking through your fingers. You can't do that. So we are causing ourselves problems by trying to hold on to the aggregates, to make something solid out of them. So we have an idea of a, or a concept of me and mine, something existing. So this is the, the third form of dukkha. Any questions at the moment? The noble truth of the origin of suffering is this. It is this thirst, or craving. 
word in Pali, tanha. Tanha, attachment, desire, um, wanting, wanting things, wanting, wanting, wanting. If you uh, think about the senses, we are always wanting. Each sense seeks out pleasant experiences. The, seek, the search for sense pleasures. We want to see pleasant sights. We want to hear pleasant sounds. Hear not only sights, not only see and hear, but also taste, touch, smell, and thought all want pleasant experiences. There's this craving, this thirst. But this thirst can never be satisfied. As soon as we have one enjoyable experience, either we want to hold on to it and stop it going away, but it changes, or we then look for another enjoyable experience. The problem is that these sense pleasures can never be fully satisfied. There will always be something else that we want. Once you've bought yourself an ancient, beat-up old car, you then say, yeah, but actually what I'd like is something a bit newer. So you want something else. The, the, the Buddha said, it, it is like pouring water into the ocean. The ocean will never overflow. It's like putting fuel on the fire. The fire will never say, OK, fine, I'm, I'm satisfied. Stop, that's enough. They always want more. And we can never satisfy this. So if you're going to go around trying to satisfy all of your sense desires all of the time, you're setting yourself an impossible goal. You can't do that. But this is what drives on a lot of our life. The, the unceasing quest for sense pleasures. But remember I said, when the, before the Buddha taught, he hesitated. He said, this is a world devoted to sense pleasures. And the Buddha's teaching is patisotagami, going against the stream. So one form of tanha is what we call karma tanha. There are two different words that are a little bit similar. There's K-A-M-A, -A, which is senses, sense desires. But there's also, you've heard the word kama, or in um, Sanskrit, karma. That means action. We're not talking about that here. We're talking about K-A-M-A, -A, kama tanha, desire for sense pleasures. That's one form of tanha. Second form of tanha is called bhava. Tanha. Bhava means to become, to continue. This means we want, oh, sorry, I should also say on the subject of karma tanha. Uh, it's not only material things that we have desire for, we also desire popularity, power, fame, reputation, all sorts of non material things can also go under the role of karma. Um, then bhava, bhava, to continue, to become something other than what we already are. This, in the extreme form, is the desire for life to continue. We don't want our life to end. We want it to go on and on 
and on. And we even have the hope, or some people have the hope, that when this particular life ends, there will be another life. My soul will continue on into some other existence. I will go to heaven. That is bhava tanha. And the opposite of bhava tanha is the bhava tanha, the I. The bhava tanha, which is the desire not to go on, not to continue. Annihilationism. I hope that when I die, nothing goes on. That's the end. It can also cause people, unfortunately, to terminate their own life. They don't want the life to go on. I've had enough. I'm fed up. I'm going to kill myself. That is the more extreme form of the Baba Tanha. So, this is what the Buddha says is the origin of Dukkha, desire. It is this thirst or craving which produces re-existence and re-becoming. That is bhava, tanha. This, in fact, is what drives forward all of the natural world. Every creature has the, has the inclination, has the desire for continuity. No, or at least almost all beings, don't want to die. Furthermore, this is what drives the whole process of reproduction. Continuity. Going on. And it's bound up with passionate greed. It finds fresh delight now here and now there, namely, and these are the three kinds, thirst for sense pleasures, thirst for existence and re-becoming, and thirst for non-existence or self-annihilation. So these are the first two truths. And if you look a little bit further down, beyond halfway, there's a paragraph that begins, this is the noble truth of suffering, dukkha. Such was the vision, the knowledge, the wisdom, the science, the light, that arose in me with regard to things not heard before. So this is the Buddha saying this is something he discovered. This suffering as a noble truth should be fully understood. With the first noble truth, our task is to understand it. So reflect on it. Look in yourself, look around the world outside and see whether it is true that there is dukkha. Even if you yourself are doing okay, if you look around at other people, there are lots of other people who are not doing okay. So you can verify this truth on the basis of your own experience. You're not asked to believe it, you're asked to understand it. Test it. Look at it. Is it true? Based on what you can see. And if you do see this, that is a very powerful stimulus to help us develop a very important quality which the Buddha highly recommended, and that is compassion. You, yourself, do not like to experience suffering. And you see other people 
experience suffering, and they, just like you, do not like to experience suffering. So when you realize that we are all in the same boat together, all of us, to a greater or lesser extent, are experiencing dukkha. Then we can feel compassion. That is the basis for this very valuable quality to look around and understand the nature of existence. The Buddha doesn't phrase this noble truth by saying, you, five men, you are suffering. That would be to personalize it. He says that this is a truth, the truth of suffering. So it's, it's universally applicable. And then if you look at the, the last paragraph, this is the noble truth of the origin of suffering. Such was the vision this origin of suffering as a noble truth should be abandoned. So the first noble truth, we have to understand it. Second noble truth, tanha, is to be abandoned. That is the, the job to be done with the second of these truths. First one, understand it. Second one, abandon it. So, this evening has been a lot of talk about unhappiness and misery. And some people, because they've misunderstood the Buddha's teachings, say that Buddhism is a very gloomy, pessimistic religion. <coughs> that all the Buddhists talk about the whole time is suffering, 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 suffering. But they have forgotten that there are four noble truths, not just two. And the Buddha said all four should be considered together. In fact, he said, he who sees suffering sees the origin of suffering, sees the cessation of suffering, and sees the path to the cessation of suffering. So we've got the bad news out of the way now. Next week, better news. <laughs> Truth number three, and eventually, Truth number four. We've turned the corner. <coughs> okay. Nine o'clock. Time to go. Um, would someone please be kind enough to wash up the tea mugs? Not Paula, as she kindly made the tea. I said, not Paula, as you kindly made the tea.